So suppose your mom bought an option based on a hot stock tip and she calls you up all excited and says, hey, I just bought this option on this great stock. How much money am I gonna make? And so you say, well, what's the stock like? And she you know, says, well, I have mu and I have sigma for the stock. How much is my option worth? How much money am I gonna make when it expires? And so you start doing some calculations and you realize that Black Shoals is not helping you very much to figure out how much money she's gonna make. So what can you do? What do you need? You actually need a probability density function, P. And so P of Y prime at time T prime given Y at T, that's how I would read that. So this is a probability density function. And so we're interpreting this as this is the given part and this is the probability density function part. So we can think about this is now and this is the future. So the density of the different states of the future given the now, that's the way we're thinking about it. And this is probability density. So to get an actual probability, we have to integrate. So an integral from A to B of P of Y T Y prime T prime dy prime. This will give us the probability that y is between a and b at time t prime, given that it's at y at time t. Okay, so how do we find p? So how do we get p? And the answer is the uh, Kolmo let's get that. Kolmogorov equation. And so let's write out what, what's y. So y is going to be a stochastic variable and have some behavior. So it'll have some deterministic part and some random part. So I'm going to call those a and b. And this is our stochastic dif differential equation for y. Then the Kolmogorov equation, the uh, it's actually the backwards. The backwards Kolmogorov equation is partial of p with respect to t plus half b y t squared second partial of p with respect to y squared plus a times p with respect to t uh, y equals zero. All right, so here's our backwards Kolmogorov equation. And remember we have a uh, p of y t y prime t prime. And so you can see this is backwards because we're solving for p as t and y change. So we're, we're given this and we're finding this side. And so we're, we're going this direction, which is why it's backwards. Okay, so we have a way of finding P. If we can solve differential equations, we can figure out what P is and work it out. That means if we have some particular you know, behavior, so let's, let's do the regular log normal. So DS is mu S DT plus S DX. This is nothing surprising, just log normal. Then how does P work? Let's do the backwards equation here. So we get partial of p with respect to t plus a half, then b squared. So b is this part, so sigma squared, s squared, then the second partial plus a, and p with respect to y equals zero. And then if you look at this, you start thinking this is similar to black shoals, but it's not actually black shoals yet. So let's think, how do we use this to value an option? So let's call v our option value, then we can set P of S comma capital T to our payoff. And we, you know, we're working, we're working backwards. So we, we set our initial conditions for P at the end, and we're working backwards with the backwards Kolmogorov equation. And how is V related to P? The answer is that V will be the discounted version of P. So P is our expected payoff and V will be the, the discounted version of the expected payoff. And so V of S T is gonna be, if I can remember how to discount, E to the negative R difference of times times P S T. So P solving the differential equation here backwards, we get the expected value of the payoff and here we're discounting it to the present and that will be our option value. Then what? Then we can notice that V satisfies almost this equation up here, just that we get this extra term. And so we actually get V with respect to T plus a half sigma squared S squared, second partial with respect to S squared plus mu S partial V with respect to S minus RV equals zero. Now this is looking even more like Black Scholes. And so what's different? This is the key difference here. So we've got the time, the volatility part, second derivative, and then here in Black Shoals, this is R in Black Shoals, and here it's mu, the drift. That's the only difference. And so what can we say? 
So we know that the Black-Scholes is the, the value of an option. And so this is the discounted value, the discounted expected value of the payoff. So we can say that an option value is discounted expected value of payoff, but with mu going to r, right? So we have to change this mu to an r. And this, this means that our random walk is actually ds equals r s dt plus sigma s dx in order to get the correct expectation value. And we actually call this a risk neutral random walk. So this is pretty cool. So this, this brings up another question. So why isn't mu the drift? Why does the drift not appear in black shoals? And when we did the expected value of the option, it did appear. And that seems kind of reasonable. Like, why isn't it just the expected value of the option? The answer is the no arbitrage argument. So no arbitrage means that if we can diversify risk, it's the same as putting the money in the bank. So if we, if we can reduce risk to zero somehow, we can't profit from it. And in the Black-Scholes model, we have an option and we're delta hedging and the delta hedge removes all the risk of the option. And therefore we end up with just the interest rate R. It makes sense, right? No arbitrage means that you don't get rewarded for taking diversifiable risk and, and risk that you can hedge. And so it's not just the expected value here. You have to assume that the random walk is a risk neutral random walk. So suppose you violated this assumption. Suppose that options actually did have a mu here, then that means you could delta hedge and you'd get the return with the mu and it would be risk-free money and you'd be getting an interest rate mu instead of an interest rate r and that would exactly violate the no arbitrage principle. So this is this is pretty amazing stuff here. Very cool. So what if you have correlated assets? So correlated assets. What does that mean? That means you have one asset S1 has a drift and sigma one S1 DX1 and a second asset that has its own drift and its own sigma. So these are these are both log normal and one thing to notice is we have X1 and X2 and these are different. So these are different sources of randomness and you know each one has its own mu and sigma drift and volatility, and they have different sources of randomness, so they're not perfectly correlated. And so we have the usual the expectation of dx1 is zero, expectation of dx squared is dt, and then we have the expectation of dx1, dx2. It's not just dt, it's rho dt. And so this is the this is the correlation coefficient here. So that tells how, how much these two different sources of randomness are correlated, okay? So now we have correlated assets. Suppose we have uh, some V is a function of S1, S2, and time. And we have a question, what is DV? And the answer is, of course, Ito's lemma. So yet another version of Ito's lemma, how's it work? So we're gonna get DV equals partial respect to T, DT, and then half sigma one squared S1 squared partial second spec to S1 dt plus a half sigma two squared S2 squared partial squared spec to S2. So this is all pretty pretty normal so far. Now we're getting some new stuff. And now we're adding sigma one, sigma two, rho, S1, S2, second derivative of V with respect to S1, S2, dt, oh, I missed a dt here. And then there's some usual stuff at the end. Partial respect to S1, ds1, partial respect to S2, ds2. All right, I think this is right. So here is Ito's lemma for two assets. And the interesting thing is this middle term here. And so there's these halves and then the coefficient here is one. Why, why did it go to one in, in front here? That's because there's actually S1, S2, and S2, S1, and those get folded in uh, into this middle term. So that's why it's not a half. And that, that row, the, the, the correlation coefficient comes in here too. All right, so now we have a formula for dv. That means we can go and do a Black-Scholes derivation. And so what do we want to do? We want to be long the option and short, short S1 and S2. So we have two underlines. So we have to go two different short factors. So if we have some position pi, long the option, and then short S1, short S2. So we have two different uh, factors, delta one and delta two. 
And now if you take the, the derivative, you get d pi equals dv minus one ds1 delta two uh, ds2. And we can use the Ito's lemma we just did for the dv and you know do the rest of the Black-Scholes uh, work here. And we end up with, let's draw an arrow, do some work that I'm not gonna show. And we end up with Black-Scholes for two assets. So partial respect to t plus a half sigma one sigma two rho S1, S2, second with respect to S1, S, S1, partial S2, plus R, S1, partial, partial V with respect to S1, plus R, S2, with respect to S2, minus R, V equals zero. I think that's right. That looks right. So here is Black Scholes for two assets. And I, I didn't do any dividends just to keep it simple. So we got that by doing the standard, you know, long the option, short both underlines, and we end up with black shoals here. All right, so that's cool. So what does that mean? That means we can do a payoff for options that is any function, any function of S1 and S2. So what are some examples? So one example is an exchange option. So an example of an exchange option is I have the right to exchange two shares of Apple, A-A-P-L, for one share, Google, G-O-O-G. -O -O so at expiration, I have the right, but not the obligation to exchange two shares that I own of Apple for one share of Google. So if Google goes up in price and Apple goes down in price, this option could be valuable at payoff for me. So what's the, what's the payoff? So it's gonna be a max of something comma zero, and it's gonna be a max of S2 minus two S1, comma zero. So if you decode this, this is paying two, two shares of Apple. So this is S1 and S2. So I'm paying two shares of Apple, getting one share of Google, and it's a max because I, I have the option to do this. I don't have to do this. So another example is a rainbow option. An example of a rainbow option might be, I have the right to buy the cheaper of two times Apple or one of Google at price E. So when the option expires, I can either pay or not pay. E. And if I choose to exercise the option, I get either two shares of Apple or one share of Google, whichever is cheaper at the time. So if, if they both go up and they both are about the same, then I, I win. If only one of them goes up and the other one goes down, I probably won't win and profit very much. So what's the payoff? So the payoff is gonna be the max of something comma zero because of the optionality here. And then what's it gonna be? If I do exercise, I'm gonna get the minimum of two Apple, so two S1 or S2. So the, the minimum minus E. So I buy and I get this one, which is the cheaper one, and I pay E and then I get the max of that or zero. So this is the, the optionality is, is the max comma zero part. Then I get the cheaper one and I pay E. So that's how the payoff is deciphered. So that's pretty cool. So we've done some examples of exotic options. So we can, we can start thinking about how to price exotic options. That's pretty neat. Suppose you look at a stock and you look at the volatility. And so you plot the log volatility and you get some distribution, some bell curve. So this is the actual volatility of the stock. If you look at the option prices on the stock, you can work backwards with the Black-Scholl solution and find the implied volatilities. So suppose you plot those and you get some slightly different bell curve. So this one is the implied volatility given the option prices, and these aren't the same. So what can you do? So one, in this case, you would sell the option. Two, you'd buy the stock to Delta Hedge. Three, profit as easy as one two three so here when you're selling the option because the implied volatility is higher than the actual volatility you're selling something that's more expensive so you're ma making money and then delta hedging because the actual volatility is lower this will be cheaper than the market thinks it is and so you'll you're selling something that's expensive and buying something cheap you make a profit okay so let's call sigma the actual volatility and sigma hat the implied volatility so there's a couple of questions. First is, how do you delta hedge? You have, you have some choices. So as you delta hedge, you need a sigma, you need a volatility to, to use, and you have a choice to you use your, your actual volatility or the implied volatility as you hedge. So that, that's one choice. And then once you do that, the, the natural question is, how much do you profit? And can you 
profit better somehow. All right, so case one, this will be use the actual volatility to delta hedge. And so in this case, we have VI is greater than VA. So this is the option price using the implied volatility in the marketplace is higher than the option price using the actual volatility. So this is why we're making money. We're selling this and effectively buying this. So sell VI. And then as we hedge, we buy delta A of the stock. And because we're hedging using the actual volatility, we've done this before. So we've done the Black-Scholes calculation, and we showed that hedging using actual volatility gives you something that's the actual option price. So this will, this will cost VA. And so in this case here, our profit is exactly VI minus VA. And so let's draw a P and L here. So our profit and loss graph at time zero, we have a profit and then we get a little bit of interest maybe. And then at expiration time, we, we have our profit. But this is our model. This doesn't say anything about the market. So at the expiration time, we know we get the profit and marking to the market, we start with zero. So, so these two points are known. So this is from the Black-Scholes, you know, assuming our, our volatility is correct and our actual volatility is the actual volatility, we must end up here. And we're starting here with nothing because our position is balanced according to the market. So the view from mark to market over here, it's gonna be some, some crazy path perhaps that goes from here to here. And it could be lots of different ways of getting over there. And we don't know what's gonna happen. And it's kind of like holding a, a bond to expiration. You know that it's gonna return the principal at the end, but the value of the bond over time could fluctuate wildly as the market changes its mind about things. All right, case two. What if we hedge using sigma hat? So use sigma hat to delta hedge. And so this means that at every time step, we're using the implied volatility to hedge our position and that we, we sort of have no choices. We don't need sigma anymore. The only choice we have is between sell the option and then buy the stock or buy the option and sell the stock. So if we're selling the option, we are long volatility. No, that's wrong. We are short volatility and over here we're long volatility. And so our, our, our only choice is which of these we do. So selling the option and then buying the stock, we think that volatility is high now because the option will be expensive and we're making money by selling the option. Here, we buy the option because volatility is cheap. We think it's going to increase. And so we sell the stock, yeah, all right. So we're choosing between these two scenarios. That's our only choice. There's no choice for, for sigma. Okay, so how do we evaluate our profits and losses? So we have our, our portfolio here. So we have the option, the stock, and cash. And I'm gonna do this the right one. So we buy the option. So our option is VI. Then the stock, we short the stock and we're using delta I, the implied volatility will give us our hedge times the stock. And then our cash, we paid for the option and we got money from shorting the stock. Okay, then D pi, what, what's the change in our position over a short time period? It's gonna be DV, so DVI, and we get this by Ito's lemma. And what's that gonna be? It's gonna be partial with respect to time dt plus partial with respect to s ds plus half sigma squared s squared second partial with respect to s. And so why did we use sigma here? This is the actual, and we use the actual because Ito's lemma talks about you know ds and ds equals mu s t plus sigma s dx. It uses the actual. And so we, we use the actual volatility here. So that's the dv part. And then we have negative delta i ds plus we get money from our interest plus delta i s dt. Okay, so here's how our portfolio changes in a, in a time step, the stochastic equation for our portfolio. Another thing to notice is that the market, from the point of view of the market, we can do a Black-Scholes portfolio and we get a Black-Scholes equation that the market is satisfying. And so this will be partial respect to time dt plus respect to s ds plus half sigma hat squared s squared dt minus delta s or ds plus r negative vi plus delta s dt. And so the market Black-Scholes gives us this equals zero. And so the interesting thing here is we're using the implied 
volatility. So this equation here, this is a stochastic differential equation that describes how VI, the implied, the volatility, the option price using the implied volatility, how that will change over time. And VI will change using the implied volatility. And that's, this is just the Black-Scholes argument with the implied volatility rather than the actual, because that's how the market is behaving. It's using the implied volatility. So here's a, an equation. We can rearrange things a little bit. Well, first we should notice that delta, delta I equals the derivative with respect to S. And that means that these cancel here. So it's just standard Black-Scholes. And we can rewrite this equation a little bit. And we're trying to simplify our, our d pi up above. I'm just moving the R over here. S D T equals negative a half sigma hat squared s squared second s squared dt that's right so i'm just rewriting this moving the equation around and now if you notice in d pi i have the dt term these two are going to cancel and i have the r term and so here i have the dt and the r term and so i can plug these in and get a new d pi so d pi equals what's left over here is the actual and then all the rest of this will be minus a half sigma hat squared squared or in other words a half sigma squared minus sigma hat squared s squared gamma i dt so this is just the definition of gamma is the second derivative here and so this one this is our daily profit so if, if we guessed correctly that volatility is going up or down during the day then we have this this profit that is non-deterministic so there's no dx so no dx or ds and so we gamma and s will change over time, but it, this will not be too stochastic. In fact, it'll be it'll be positive too because our actual volatility is higher than the implied volatility, and we bet correctly. So every day we're making money, and this is how much. But because s and and gamma are changing, our our p and l here over time is going to start at zero, and it's not always going to end up at the same point. It's going to increase and level out at different points. They should never be actually be going down. I'm just not very good at drawing, and so there'll be different profits we'll get at the end, but our, our path to getting there will be nice uh, monotonically increasing profits over time for this delta hedging strategy. That's pretty cool. So what we've done is we showed how if implied and actual volatilities are different, we can make profit. And if we use the actual volatility to delta hedge, then we lock in our profits, but the way we get there is kind of a bit random. And if we use the implied volatility, then our total profit at the end is not that great, but we have a nice, you know, non-random daily profit. So we're making money every day. It's pretty cool stuff.